were talking about how in book one, we were talking about the food and how great it was. This girl was hungry all the time. I mean, it became comical, actually. <laughs> I'm hungry. Is this all we got to eat? What we eating? I want some avocados. I'm like, oh my God. And then, and then when she gets to the city that they're going to and they actually have hot food, I'm too tired to eat. I was like, are you kidding me? You've been complaining about how hungry you are the whole time. And then you finally get a hot meal and you want to go to bed. Oh my God. Welcome to the Novel Universe with your hostesses, Ashley and Dawn. We rate and review the newest and most buzzworthy books. We are true book club girls who don't always agree, but do enjoy a good book discussion. I'm Ashley, the fantasy architect. And I'm Dawn, the criticizer of books. Grab your favorite beverage and come and enjoy our universe. everyone and welcome back to the novel universe with your hostesses Ashley and Dawn and today we will be discussing Written in Starlight which is book two of Woven in Moonlight by a <laughs> Isabel Ibanez. I I blanked for a second I know her name I blanked <laughs> before we get started <laughs> there's something that we never do that we should do which is if you like what you're hearing please follow our podcast so you will have updates when we upload. Yeah, that wasn't clunky at all. All right. Uh, as always, we will start with the spoiler free and then we will go into the spoiler edition and we will make sure that we let you know when we have started our spoilers. So here we go. All right, Ashley, what did you give written in Starlight? I gave it a two. <sighs> So I wanted to give it a two, but I didn't hate it as much as Lore. So I felt like I should give it a two and a half, but I really want to give it a two. What should I do? I feel like I should also do a two and a half because I did not hate it as much as Lore. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Because here's here's the thing with this book. This book is very easy to read. Mm -hmm. It is a very quick read. It sucks you right in. And you, you're going along and you're like, all right. And then you're still going along in the same line. And you're like, why are we still happening here? But I'm still going with you. Like wherever we're going, it's fine. And all of a sudden you get to like 80% done. And then all of a sudden, all these things are happening. And now we're done. I'm like, okay, how do I feel? I don't love it as much as I love the first one. And that makes me so sad because we raved about, um, nope, Woven in Moonlight. Last year, it was in our top 10 best reads of the year for our podcast. It was in our personal, like, top 10. And this one, yeah, no, I think I'm just going to have to get a 2.5. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that because this arc, okay, so... Woven in Moonlight was published in what, February of last year? Something like that? Early, early. In January. It's January. Okay. So the arc of this book was available in summer. So she just wrote this book. This, this book has been sitting in my downloads for months. And I didn't want to read it because I wanted to wait until closer to the release date. She wrote this too early. Woven in Moonlight just got a nomination for a debut author award. Like, that's a big deal. This soft book is incredibly unfortunate. I, I was very upset <laughs> that I wasted my time with this book. So, uh -huh. um, why don't we get into the dislikes? So, what was your first dislike? All right. Um... Uh... My first list dislike is where is the depth? I felt like this book could have been a Navilia, one that is like, you know, or a prequel or like an in-between to the next one. Or if maybe she would have extended uh, the chapters to include, you know, Rumi and Azima, like, and all of them in, in between, I feel like Catalina's story would have moved more fluidly and we would have saw the depth and growth of her character better if it was accompanied by something else because it was 
just it was just lacking depth because I'm like, okay, she's exiled, which we know about from the last book. She gets stranded in a jungle. They leave her there, and you're like, all right, homegirl's going to make it because someone's going to come and find her, when you know, and then you predict that someone's going to find her, and then you're like, oh, and of course it's this person, like, and all of these things that, that happen. I'm just like, I, I felt like I was walking through the jungle a lot, <laughs> and I didn't need to be in the jungle that long to get to you where all the action was at the end. Now, I mean, it still writes her books with a lot of detail. I can see the imagery. I can see where she's coming from. I mean, to quote, she described the trees that were broccoli heads on cinnamon sticks. And I was like, I can see what the tree looks like now. But it was just like, she knows how to write. It, it's missing that middle part to hold us over into the big part or differently and yeah <laughs> yes. <first> is like <laughs> yes I totally agree I felt like and I think you make you make a good point by saying this should have been a novella or a prequel or something because I, I'm just like what was the point of the story I don't know what the point was and there's several factors for me but one of them is book one follows Zemena and so at the end of book one we know why Zemena has made the choice of having Tamaya. I probably should say that if you haven't read book one, don't, don't listen to this. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is all spoilers. All spoilers sorry. For book like one. for book one. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the book, Z- Zemena and Tamaya, we know that Tamaya is on the up and up. So for Catalina to be complaining the whole time that, she kicked me out. She was my friend. How could she do this to me? She betrayed me. We already know in a story and we already know that everything is okay. So why, how am I supposed to be on Catalina's side when I know Zemina is okay? Like that, and it's like 60% of the book is just her bitching and moaning about her wanting to be queen and Zemina took her throne away and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, she didn't. So it, Mm-hmm. So to make your point is like there, there was no there was no point to the story. It really should have been a novella, or we should have had Zemena in there, or something like you said. And the writing was so elementary. It was like this was a middle grade book. This, yes, yes. It's like she regressed. I don't understand. This book has, like you said, no depth. It's not challenging anybody. There's nothing critical here. There are no themes here. This is going to be a short podcast, guys, because I got nothing to talk about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And the story, the, the story was too long to get this whole entire process of how Catalina is going to move forward with this information that she's been given with and trying to find her path in this life that she's exiled. Um, her people are no longer following her anymore. It's just like, okay, we but we spent 65% of this book following her and Manuel through the jungle trying not to die. I'm like, but it's just, it was, it was so sad because I even, that, that was my, one of my next points that you said was the fact that this felt very elementary. I felt like I was reading a juvenile book versus a young adult book. And she regressed in a lot of her writing style that I loved. I loved the, the Latina heritage stuff that she puts in there, the way that she talks about colors and food and the places that she's seeing, like all of these things I got somewhat, but it was like 31%, maybe 40%. It's just, it's, it's disappointing is what it is. I was really looking forward to read this book because we read lore beforehand and lore was just a, you know, so it's like, I was excited to read something that I know is going to be good because I love this author. And now I'm disappointed. Yeah. Cause, cause now I don't want to read the next one. Oh, I'm not reading If she comes out one. with another book. I'm not reading that. Are you kidding me? Heck no. I did not like the magic system. I felt like it had no rules. And Jay Kristoff said this, I don't know if it was on Twitter or something, which probably was, that's only where I follow him is Twitter, 
where he said that your magic system has to have rules because otherwise the author can just make it up as they go along and then the reader is just lost. And I'm like, okay, so so Catalina can talk to Luna, which is her god, her goddess. But it's like, can does she tell her stuff that's going to happen within the next hour? Can she see into the future from a year from now? Like, I don't know the rules of this and it just keeps changing oh no she she only gives you a couple words and then you have to fill in the gaps and then it's like I didn't like I I like the concept of it I like Luna and that she's a seer Catalina's a seer I liked all of that but the magic system just didn't do it for me Mm mm-hmm yeah, no, and I agree because the whole point that I think the author was trying to put to show us was that Catalina has been so sequestered in her own body and her own mind and her own people and the things that she thought for her whole entire life that she has no idea how the outside world works. She has no idea that other people could have magic like her. And so we're like put into this like, turbine effect where we're just spinning around and she's like why why can they do that why is Luna talking to them no they're only supposed to, she's only supposed to talk to me I'm the only one that's supposed to have this power and I'm thinking to myself you like snotty stuck up Condessa like <laughs> when we know that your right hand maid which is your best friend Zima whatever however we say her name she has uh, powers to weave, uh, excuse me, she has the power to make tapestries come to life through her weaving. And it's all by Luna shining in on her. So it's like, it's not just you that has this ability to speak to this goddess. So yeah, no, I, I agree. I, did, I don't, there was not enough with the magic system. <laughs> they made their Mm -hmm. um oh i i did not like the villain i did not i did no Mm -mm. we'll just leave it at that yeah we'll save it for the spoiler i didn't like the villain either yeah yeah no yeah i got a whole section of that in the spoiler edition moving (laughs) along uh let me see what i have here in my notes you kind of already said it, like I was going to say that the writing was just too simple. It was just a jungle adventure with some poisonous insects and wild animals, a very simple romance. There's no nuance anywhere in the story. I didn't like the romance at all. And once again, we can get into that in the spoiler edition. But the romance was just contrived. They were, you can see her forcing them in these situations. You could see it. And when you can see it, it's just not... It's not organic. You're not falling for their love. It's, yeah, no. Well, we can get into the spoiler part, but it's like there, there's no depth to that either. It's no. just happened upon. And you're like, well, duh, it's a friends to lovers trope. Here we go. Yeah, it's a trope. Here we go. It's a huge trope. Just, it's, just, yeah. And it's not even just friends to lovers. It's that whole thing of I'm your guard. And I can't fall in love with you. You need to go find a king to sit on a throne because I'm not worthy of you. BS that we've read so many times. And she didn't do anything with it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Can I just say one thing? And I know this is my fault. And I was getting ready to text you at some point. It took me, I want to say, 20% to realize that we were following a different character. I didn't even know. I thought it was Amena. I was like, what is she talking about? Who? This is not the same girl I read in book one. No fucking duh, Dawn. It's a different character. That's my fault, though, because I couldn't remember what happened in book one. But I just thought I needed to share that, that I didn't even know that this was a totally different character until like 20% in the book. But hey. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Yeah, I was a little confused that uh, 
the way that we're brought into the story that the people who bring her into the jungle, I was like, why are you, why are you there? But okay, I guess. <laughs> so uh, that's all I really have that I can say that that's spoilering for things I didn't like. Um, I have a couple more and I have some nitpicks, mm-hmm. but, um, this book suffers for, uh, what I call the sudden epiphanies and that's a deal breaker for me, meaning I'm gonna lower a star immediately. And that's when she's trucking along and all of a sudden, <gasps> ding, ding, ding. I know what that means. No background information. She doesn't have someone helping her who might be more knowledgeable. This girl all of a sudden knows about this poisonous plant. She ain't no dang botanist. How does she know? She just all of a sudden knows everything. That is such cheap writing. I hate that. I hate that. That happened several times. Uh, Let's see. (laughs) There was a little bit of a deus ex machina. We'll save that for the spoiler edition. I didn't like at all. I had a little couple of nitpicks here. So Catalina needed constant validation from Manuel. You're worthy. You're beautiful. You're strong. I mean, constant. I couldn't take it (laughs) anymore. And then you were talking about how in book one, we were talking about the food and how great it was. This girl was hungry all the time. I mean, it became comical, actually. (laughs) I'm hungry. Is this all we got to eat? What we eating? I want some avocados. I'm like, oh my God. And then, and then when she gets to the city that they're going to and they actually have hot food, I'm too tired to eat. I was like, are you kidding me? You've been complaining about how hungry you are the whole time. And then you finally get a hot meal and you want to go to bed. Oh my God. So me nuts. I, I wrote down <laughs> to go off of that. Catalina is whiny, narcissistic, entitled, obviously convenient. She, or sorry, no, that was a different line. Just end with entitled. She's whiny, narcissistic, and very entitled. And I just, I don't like that. I, I cannot follow her character. The same thing you said about how hungry she was as like, Oh my gosh! Have, I mean, your your people were just starving in book yes. one. They were just starving. Yes. It's have not you like she had was... all the food reserves. I know it wasn't like she was like <laughs> eating like prime rib every night when she was in her hometown. She was eating rice and beans. No. They were starving. I they know. were rationing food. And then the first meal she gets with Manuel, he cooks her some eggs, and she was like, "Is this it?" I was like, oh, hell no. She was like, is this it? Oh, God. I don't, I don't understand what the point of that was. I don't I understand. Don't Other than to understand that she was, was so spoiled and so just not grateful for what she's been given ever at all with her gift, her title, her friends, like she lacks this gratefulness and respect for it. That it's just a, well, I want to be satisfied. So please help me. Am I doing a good job? Okay. Can can you tell me again? I'm doing a good job. Yeah. Can can, can you tell me I can do it, please? (laughs) I'm waiting. I'm I'm waiting. Hello. (laughs) I'm waiting with my eggs and my avocado toast. Can you tell me how beautiful and how great I am? Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I can't read my oh 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 this is a nitpick but this this killed me okay so they have been given some very important information the day of this huge festival that this three-day festival that they're about to have and the information is so dire that they need to cancel the festival and uh Sanko I was calling him Zonko by the way like Harry Potter the Zonko store and Sanko he's calling him like Sonic (laughs) he's like we can't cancel the festival but no 
But they're like, no, 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 something's really bad about to happen. He's like, no, we can't cancel the festival because people will think there's something wrong. So they, they're they like, dire situation. And then at the festival, boy, they are dancing. And guess what? They eating. They eating good. Uh, just 20 minutes ago, there was a, a poisonous snake about to kill everybody, but uh, we dancing in the streets. Okay. <sighs> okay. I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore after that one. I was just like, oh, well. Okay. You texted me. <laughs> How far are you? <laughs> oh, that was all by so funny. All right. Yeah. Did you like, like anything? Like we said, this book last. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What'd you say? Go ahead. What'd you say? I was just gonna oh, transition I was just to the lights. That the book lap lapped. It lacked depth <laughs> and plot lines and consistency and congruency with other characters. I just I'm so disappointed. I, I can't say it enough. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Did you have any yep. likes? I did like the fact that with their magic that she has from Luna and Chesh, Cha, 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 how do you say her name? Chaska? Chaska? Chaska. Chaska. Chaska, who is also a seer from this, you know, golden village that they're, or golden kingdom that they're at right now. You know, Kelly is trying to gain unity with the kings and then that way she can get her people back and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Uh, I liked the fact that Chashka shows her that in order for her to access her power, she needs to love all of the gods, meaning Luna, Pachamama, and that's Pachamama, and then I don't know what the sun <laughs> god's name is. I didn't write it down. Lit- Lita? But Lita? I liked that fact that it's not just like you're not just worshiping Luna. Like, like everything is connected together. You know, you need to make sure that you're hitting all your points here, which I think just added to Catalina's character and how she then transforms in understanding that everything has to work together in a peaceful harmony in order for it to work. This one-sidedness is not going to work, which that's what I did see out of, you know, her self-discovery, but it was also a very easy thing to see. It was easy concepts. I didn't have to think hard with this book, which I guess if you're wanting a lighter read to just zip on through, go for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's see. Did I have something else that I liked about it? Oh, there was one quote that I really liked, and this is just a part of how amazing this author is in her first book, um, where Chaska asks asks Catalina, are you afraid of what will happen if you let go of your anger? And I think that that was like a key point in this whole entire story. Catalina has been carrying this anger towards other people and what they've done to her people for so long that she doesn't know how to be without her anger. And I was like, there's a gold nugget. Thank you very much. Okay. Now give me a little more. And I didn't do that, no. but that was the one quote that I had highlighted. I was like, all right, that's good. Right there. Yeah. You're drawing um, the character to realize something inwardly about themselves that they are struggling with and that they have to come to this crossroad and am I going to continue this way or continue this way? And how am I going to survive without the other? I like that. That was a dumb one. No. <laughs> yeah, I also documented that, and then I'll talk about in the spoiler edition how it went terribly wrong after that. Okay. <laughs> because yeah. the yeah. second after he said that, it was Zonko, by the way. Sanka, who said that? Uh, I liked that there's some Spanish 101 in here. I felt like I could speak a little Spanish. I was like, oh, I know what that means, because mm-hmm. I took Spanish 1 in high school. So, I like that. Uh, I do think this is a good book for younger teens. Like like we said, this is more of a juvenile book. The first book I would consider YA, but this book would is like juvenile, juvenile. middle grade fiction. Yep. So it is a good book for younger teens because they're it, it's quick. 
and there's some cool monsters and magic in here that they will probably like but uh, as an adult reader you're not going to be challenged much and I did like the mythology of like I like the poison flower I like the butterfly I'm not gonna say what happened to the butterfly because it's you know it's not a spoiler but it's kind of cool I like the butterfly love that and part. the jaguar and like so like the mythical stuff was really cool I wish it could have been more integrated into the story and not just some jungle adventure but that's about all I like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Well. All right. Well, that that's is, all I have. Yeah. That is our spoiler-free review of Written in Moonlight. That is not right. Written in Starlight by <laughs> El... Why can I not say her name? Isabel Ibenez. Isabel I mean, I think it's because of the two eyes, and it's confusing me. I want to call her Elizabeth. That's what's wrong. Isabel Ibenez. And our next podcast, we were going to do Gilded Ones, but we're not going to get the book in time. So we have switched it to, was it? We just switched it 10 minutes ago. The Girl Upstairs? That's not right. The, the Wife the Upstairs. Girl upstairs. Is it The Wife Upstairs? Wife upstairs? The Wife Upstairs it's by Rachel Hawkins. Yes. Someone is upstairs. The Someone Wife upstairs. upstairs. Yeah. That is adult thriller. So we're going to be doing some more adult books because our first two YA books has been garbage. So we're going to we're going to try something different next month and do some adult. All right. Mm -hmm. So we are now going to get into the spoiler edition of Written in Starlight in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. These days, small authors are including mental health content in their books. But do you ever wonder how accurate some of this stuff is? Or do you ever read something where you know the author just gets it? I'm Elise. And I'm Priscilla. And we are Novel Feelings, a podcast where we discuss mental health issues in fiction novels. We are psychologists and book lovers, and we have a lot of opinions. So look for Novel Feelings wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to your show. Okay. The writing was just super clunky. It was just super clunky and chunky and bad. And okay, so this was one of my my biggest reasons for not my biggest reason, but it was a problem for me was, okay, so she is going to Sanko and she is like, look, I have all my anger. I need to get rid of these, the illustrians or I can't remember who's who. I think they're illustrians and the other people or something else. We need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And I need your army to do it. And he's like, um, I don't want to get involved in your war. What's in this for me? Accurately so. And she's like, okay. Then she comes back the next day. I need your army. And he's like, no, I'm not going to sacrifice my people in my land for your revenge that I want nothing to do with. And she's like, okay. The next day, I need your army. Hello? You're not giving him anything in return. This isn't NATO. We don't have a whole bunch yep. of union or a whole bunch of countries together banding together to make sure that one nation doesn't defeat. You know what I mean? This is not NATO. Like yeah. they're not going to risk their country and their people for your war. And it just bothered me that she just just like, well, I, I'm the I'm the Quintessa and I need your army and you need to just do it. No, that is not a thing. And eventually he does say okay, you're a seer. I need more seers for, for me and my people. Let's go that route and I'll give you my army. But the fact that she just kept asking him over and over and over again, and he's just like, no, I'm not going to do that. It just shows how, like you said, how entitled she mm -hmm. was. And it drove me nuts. Yeah, I did not like that at all. I also didn't like the fact that Manuel didn't advise her not to ask for his help without promising something else in return. I mean, like you're trying to strike up an agreement, a contract, if you will, between two different nations. You don't just walk over and be like, Hey guys, uh, I need your army for a little bit. I'll send them back when I'm done, when I get my way. Cool. Sounds good. No, that's not, <laughs> that's not how this works here. And, but she's just so entirely spoiled that she has no idea how to communicate with other adversaries or other kingdoms, if you will. She doesn't know what to do with diplomacy mm -hmm. at all. She has no idea. I did not like that at all. And I didn't like the fact that, you know, like she didn't even think 
about the fact that what she can offer is her hand in marriage. She has nothing else to offer. The title. She is nothing but her title. That's it. Mm -hmm. Her people are already gone. They're already molded in with everybody else because they want to have unity. You know, that, that whole thing, it's excellent. And she just still is, she reminds me of Jafar from Aladdin. Like, no, I'm still unhappy with what's happening. I want things my way and that's how it's going to be. Even though everything she's doing is wrong. I don't, I, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't like that. And that would have been okay if there was only 25% of the book. But the fact that we get to 70% of the book before Zanko is like, look, you need to let go of your anger. Because this is, I, I know what's happening over in uh, that other land with Zemena and everybody's happy. They're all, she invited everybody back. Everybody's great. You, you need 70%. You mean to tell me I listened to this girl bitch and whine and complain for 70% only for him to be like, you need to let it go. And then she was just like, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to be queen anymore. I'm sorry. What? 80%. And now we don't want to be clean. (laughs) Or, you know, who says that you can be both titles when they pulled that line out? You can eat, you can be queen or a seer, you, but you cannot be both because one's going to call you somewhere else. What? No, what to me, it sounds like, well, you're not getting what you want, so you got something to fall back on. So there you go. I did not like the fact that we did not meet Sanko until 75% of this book. Mm-hmm. The fact that she, that, that we didn't meet them sooner, you know, we knew about the pale not the pale people, but the, the her, how do you say them? The Aurelians, how they were following them. We knew about that. We knew about the fact that they were trying to kill them. And then they're like, well, you know, if you can pass this test, we'll let you go into our city and that was meet stupid. our king. That was dumb as shit. But you have to prove yourself worthy. I'm like, okay, why did it take us so long to get to that point? I don't get that. Because... Because Ibinez is trying to set up this romance that is stupid. She's taken all this time to set up this terrible romance and sacrificing good plot and an interesting country with Shaka and Zanko and Kusi for a romance that is stupid. That's why. You know what it reminded me of? It reminded the the romance area uh, reminding me of a dance of thieves where, um, what's her name is like stuck with the prince or whatever. And she's like, I don't want to be with you. You don't want to be with me either. And then they end up like falling for each other. Cause they're like stuck in the wilderness, like mm-hmm. trying to survive. Yeah. Okay. Way better, way better story. I am all for this. But what was happening here with Manuel? Okay. He's been missing for three years. Three years, you kissed time, a stolen moment, one time. There is no foundation to your romance. I'm sorry. It's like holding on to a childlike dream is what it feels like. And then that's how it's written. Sorry, I didn't mean to clap, but that's just how I feel. (laughs) (laughs) It's just not... It made me not like the fact of when they do get together and you're like, okay, am I happy that she's not with Sanko? Yeah, a little bit, but I don't know. It's, there was no duty. There was no duty for her. She could just do whatever the heck she wanted. Whereas Manuel was like so driven by his duty that he hears about the death of his mom and his sister. And he decides, well, instead of leaving you here, I am going to do what is honorable and stay close to you and make sure you see this out. Okay, we've heard this heroic talk numerous times in every single story we've ever heard. But there was nothing unique about their romance. No. Other than they had a commonality in the people that they loved and cared about. That's all I saw. Mm-hmm. And he would not leave. He kept trying to leave, too. Like, to just be like, okay, bye, girl. You're obviously in capable hands. I'm going to see you later. And then he'd be like, no, you were without me. 
No, do not touch her. No, you cannot do this, Catalina. No, I need to save you. Like, over and over again. Uh-huh. And Manuel was just obviously a super convenient choice. We know nothing about Manuel in the first book other than, like, a blip of his name. Mm-hmm. If that. And then all of a sudden, oh, but guess who's stuck in the jungle? Oh, your, your guard's son, who we haven't seen in years. He's just... He's just here. Yes. Save you. That's just great. One part of the book that I just, and this is why I say their romance was so contrived and so forth, is, okay, so they get to, I don't even know, remember the name of the Golden City. We'll just call it the Golden City. Golden Corral. We'll call it the Golden Corral. They get to the Golden Corral, and they, they, uh, he's guarding her, and he's like, I need to sleep out on the floor, on the ground, outside your, your hut. And she's like, okay, cool. So then a couple days later, he's like, okay, uh, hey, girl, I got to go with these other people to find about this flower. And she's like, what about me? Uh, what about my safety? And he's like, you'll be fine. You're safe here. You're fine. He's gone for two days. And then he comes back. He's exhausted. He's done seeing people get their arms ripped off. He's he's exhausted. So he's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go sleep outside your hut and guard you because I need, I need, to, I need to protect you. Uh, dude, you've been gone for two days and nothing happened to her. And she's like, no, you're tired. You need to sleep in the bed. And he's like, no, no, I gotta, I gotta be out here and save you. Oh, come sleep in my bed and let's cast. It's like, oh my God. I love how he <laughs> went away to find the poison flower for two days. And he was like, oh girl, you fine. Ain't nobody gonna bother you here. But the second he comes back, oh no, I cannot go sleep in my own bed. I must guard you and protect you. It's... It's so forced. And you know what's disappointing, too, is I did not understand Manuel's sense of duty to these other people. His duty is was to Catalina. Why in the world are you volunteering your life to go find what's killing the land? You're not a citizen here. <laughs> I'm not a citizen here. Oh, my God. You don't pay taxes. <laughs> I don't know. It's a good point. But it's true. That's why I'm laughing. Is because it's like, why? I don't know. I don't understand. It's like this need to always be the hero sacrificing. No matter what. Well, but because I also read he that really over loved and over her, again. Ashley, even though he was her bodyguard and he's Kevin Costner and she's Whitney Houston, he cannot leave her by herself because he loves her. What about that time when she was like, you've been out here for eight months. What have you been doing? Did you meet anybody? And he was like, oh, yeah, I met this girl and I told her, uh, I don't need you no more Bajo. And then she was like, why did you do that? And he was like, I just used her. What was the point of that story? What was the point of that story? <laughs> it just came out of nowhere. And I thought it was Shaska for a second. I was like, oh, it's Shaska. Oh, it's own. No, it wasn't her. I'm like, what was the point? <laughs> oh, God, why did we read this book? I didn't even think it was Shaska. I was just like, it's some poor village girl <laughs> lost. <laughs> talk about is I did not like the fact that Rumi was one of the people that a talk or whatever the villain of the story mm-hmm. he had you know intercepted their travel party because they were the ones that brought Catalina in to make sure she was safe and like I get that he was there for Zima like to make sure that his her best friend was taken care of even though she's being freaking banished into a jungle that eats you alive okay um you know the trees are poisonous so certain grass and everything just walk straight ahead don't touch anything okay in a jungle of foliage sounds good I did not like the fact that Rumi and his guards were the pale possessed people taking other people yeah, basically, like, yeah. basically, they were White Walkers from Game of Thrones. That's what that was. Yeah. 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 
I was like, okay, first, because I remember saying to you after we read Woven in Moonlight that I bet you Atok and um, Catalina are going to somehow conspire together. Do you remember this conversation? We were like, they're going to come together and come back in and be like, no, this is not how we want things to be done. Do you remember this? It wasn't Atok. It was the priest. Yeah. But that's the guy. He gets banished, too. Oh, the priest. Oh, okay. Yo, I don't remember, but I believe you. Yeah. So when that happened, I was like, oh, there he is. <laughs> I've been looking for you. You got lost in the jungle. And he's like, I need to find this this gold. So-and-so's kingdom It's going to align with me, and I'm going to gain their whole army and all of their power. And I'm like, you just sound like Catalina, only you're a little bit more vicious sounding. A little bit. That's all. And he pops in 90%. Oh. We meet him. Do you do you have the percentage of when he's defeated? Because I wrote at 90%, here comes a villain. But I wrote, I love that you put 90% as well. Did you write at what point he, he leaves that he's defeated? Did you put it? What'd you put? Uh, no, I didn't write that part down. No. 95%. He is defeated in 5%. Yeah. Rather mm-hmm. Oh, quickly. and Sanko dies. Sanko's dead. Sanko's dead. I don't know what that was. Half of his guards are dead. I keep smacking my microphone because I'm like so frustrated. Sorry. What was the point of Sanko? We didn't even need Sanko. There's no point of Sanko. Mm -mm. (sighs) No. Or Kushi, whatever that guy's name is. Yeah, Kushi, Kushi. What I was saying was that... uh, What was I saying? (laughs) Um... (laughs) What was I saying? Oh, Lord. It's something to do with, um, oh, okay. So in the five, in the 5% that she defeats him. So we talked about how Sanko is like, Hey girl, you need to let it go. And this is her, clearly her, her growth moment, if you will. And she's like, okay, I I don't want to be queen anymore. And then here comes the priest and he's like killing people. And his whole motive was, dumb as shit because he wants revenge because they wronged his family and he wants the throne okay whatever dude so he like yeah he's he's telling his whole his whole jam about what he's gonna do and then all of a sudden she figures it out sudden epiphanies she figures out what to do Mm -hmm. and then luna just inhibits her body and takes over um oh homegirl did not she did not grow she did not defeat the thing. Somebody did it for her. Luna did it for her. She did nothing. She's pointless. Why did we mm-hmm. need her? Why didn't we just have Luna the whole time? Yeah. I agree. Frustrated. I agree. With that one. And that's what I was calling a day of yeah. machina because somebody just comes up and swoops in and saves the day. Mm hmm. Well, and it's, here's another thing as well. We talked about the fact that there are no rules with this magic. There is another point right there. What, nobody said, if Luna finds you a worthy vessel, you can access her power to make sure there is restoration for the people. Okay, tell us that somewhere. Um, even homegirl Shashka had no idea that you could do that. You know? <laughs> she's this is something else i did not think was okay both of the seers saw different things they saw different things and how they were supposed to move on with their lives they did not see the same thing as each other It was always different and it was always in these like one word little constellations that you had to somehow piece together and i did not like that at all because there was no consistency no it, I, you you can't trust Luna. She's showing somebody else something else. Does that mean that that's their destiny? That that's why? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And, and then they all know that Luna's inhibiting her at the end. I didn't even think about that. Oh, are you back? Are you back? Are you back to me now? She sent this dumb flower. Luna sent this dumb moon flower for her people. Oh. It, what? 
We didn't hear about this flower in book one. What's the thing with the flower? No, no, no. I wish you guys could see our faces. I'm sorry. This is not a more uplifting podcast that we have. We're just like two girls spilling our tea over here. Like, did you see that? Mm, I don't know if I like that. (laughs) Yeah. And now she's she's Luna and she's the bomb dot com. I don't know. I don't I don't know the point. I don't mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. It was that's all I got, man. I got I got nothing else. Same here. That's all I have. It ended too perfectly, if you will. Yeah. It really did. Um, I'm glad that there was restoration between their friendships. That's awesome. Whatever. Now she's living with the other people and she's changed herself into who she needs to be. Fine. Sounds good. But yeah, it was just, it was too clean. You know, people died because in the story, some people need to die in order to add some oomph, some excitement. But I wasn't attached to the people who died. So it really did not bother me that they were dead Mm-mm. or alive. Mm-mm. So. Yeah, guys, that has been our podcast of Written in Starlight. <laughs> Don't. So far, January is off to a great start. Oh my God. We're hoping that February brings some more good news. <laughs> please, please. This is every, every year. It never fails. I always end my, my year, my reading year, end the year, whatever, on a great book. I always on a great book and the freaking first book I read in the new year is always shit. It has happened three years in a row. <laughs> three years in a row. Well, see, that didn't happen to me. It didn't happen to me because I finished the Jay Kristoff series, so it's good. Oh. Like, I had some some good some goodness. Good for you. But John was way ahead of the time there. It's fine. Yeah. My first book was lore. <laughs> Yay. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, I think we have <laughs> ripped this book a new one enough. I would still recommend book one. Well, if you're still in the spoiler edition, you probably read book one. But yes, book one, I would still recommend it. I still liked it. I don't know what happened in book two. I will not be reading book three if there is one. So, yeah, that's all we have for you today. Thank you for joining us, and we will catch you in the next podcast. <laughs> Bye-bye.